lecture, I'm going to take you through a bit of the history of HTML and CSS. This is a lecture I tend to enjoy, largely because I feel like I have lived through a lot of this. I returned to college after getting married and having kids in the fall of 1996. And I really got my first introduction to HTML in 1997, 1998, somewhere in there while I was in college. And at the time, I remember one of the biggest things to hit the internet had nothing to do with HTML. It had to do with how people access the internet. And a lot of people listening to this lecture aren't going to remember life before Google. But before Google, before the internet, way back when we actually used textbooks instead of Google to figure things out, I became a computer science student. And I was fascinated by all things computers. And the most exciting thing that happened during my time at college was not the Y2K scare. Does anybody even remember that anymore? It was the change in pricing plans for getting on the internet. Late 1996, early 1997, America Online and other internet service providers changed their pricing plan. They went from an hourly pricing plan to a monthly pricing plan, and that changed everything. I remember working online and getting booted off because I was inactive for too long. They were not ready to handle the influx of people who wanted to be online. I was one of them. We've gotten a lot faster bandwidth since then, and lots of other things have changed. But really, I got online with a lot of other Americans in 1990, it was end of 96, early 97, and fell in love with the internet and wanted to be able to create content. So the first opportunity I took, or I got, I took a, took a class in HTML. And I remember that first textbook being able to pretty much pull all of the tags that are part of the HTML language out on a single cheat sheet. There still aren't that many, and it's pretty easy to learn to use, but there's a lot of additional things that have been labeled as being part of HTML, which aren't quite. But let's start with what HTML really is. In the beginning, there was SGML. My first introduction to SGML, which is the standard generalized markup language, was back when the screens were black and the letters were green. And if you wanted something in your document to be bold, you had to indicate that through markup. So it has tags, an opening tag with the letter B between two triangular brackets. That's how you would open or begin where something would be bold. Then your text that would be bold would be written until it reaches the closing tag, which is the same thing as the opening tag, except with a slash or um, whack mark, it's sometimes called, in the tag. And so everything between that would be bold. The language that did this formatting was called SGML. Back in the day, and I was very, I had an interesting experience growing up because my dad worked at um, Motorola. He was a programmer back in the day. Everybody else, their parents tell them how they had to walk uphill to school both ways in the snow in July. And my dad's horror stories of growing up and how much harder he had it than me was he had to learn to program using punch cards. Don't drop them. Well, I'm old, but not that old. So I started to learn to program on black screens with green letters. And back in the early 80s, my dad had a really awesome, expensive, high-end computer. It was amazing. It had dual disk drives. And the cool thing about that is that meant that you could have your operating system on one and your software on the other. As a side note, my dad got a computer, my mom got a car. She got a Chevy Chevette, he got a PC. His was an IBM PC at the time. They cost about the same amount. But I would like to borrow my dad's computer, which helped me with school measurably, and he had a word processor called PE, Personal Editor. 
And if you wanted to bolt something, you did use this markup language. Well, I left home, didn't, couldn't afford a computer on my own, and it was a few years before I went back to college. When I went to college, things had changed a little, and you were now seeing, and it, it was blue and red, it was personal, not personal editor at this point in college, I was learning WordPerfect. And WordPerfect had the option where you could see the code at the bottom of your screen while you, while you wrote your document up at the top. And so you could go in and you could change the code and you could deal directly with the code because people have been doing that for years. And that code was SGML, Standard Generalized Markup Language. Surprise, it's probably still going on behind Word and the other word processing software. <coughs> but you don't get the chance to see or directly edit it anymore. But in the 90s, exciting things were happening right here in Illinois, where I'm from. The University of Illinois was the first place to introduce a web browser. That first browser was Mosaic, and the gentleman working on it, who created it, Mark Andreessen, went on to start Netscape. Back when I was in college in the late 90s, we were going through the browser wars, which was basically Netscape versus Internet Explorer. Believe it or not, there was a time when you actually had to pay to buy a web browser. Well, things have changed a lot since then. Now, you'll notice HTML 3.2 1997, to me that was a big turning point where people really started to get online. The web existed before then. Browsers existed before then, back to the early 90s. And you'll see that HTML went through several versions, but really when most people were starting to get online, it was in version 3. When I started to learn HTML, it was either version 3 or version 4. I, start, I think I was really starting in HTML 4.0 because I was around 99. I graduated from 99, so I probably was learning at 97, 98 because I hadn't been at college very long when I was learning it. And I've been making web pages ever since. And around 2000, the standards changed to XHTML. Well, as a programmer, I was kind of a fan of this because HTML is sort of loose and sloppy. You can pretty much do a lot of things wrong and it'll still display just right. XHTML, a little bit more unforgiving, very strict on how you should code things, on how you should pair tags, on when and where to use capital letters. And what XHTML really is, is a combination of XML, which is really a data definition language that is commonly used to transfer data between various databases and HTML. So it was extensible. You could make it semantic. The only real issue in my mind was the fact that it was not backward compatible. It wouldn't support all the earlier versions of HTML. And there was a lot, and still is, a lot of historic code on the internet. Well, there was a fight because going forward, bearing in mind that web standards are going to continue to change, it will probably slow down a little bit at some point in time, but this is a very young technology. So things are changing really rapidly. And they were working on, they being the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, they set the web standards, they were working on XHTML 2.0. An offshoot branch, Whatwig, did, did not like the direction that XHTML was heading, and so they decided to go back to the drawing board, starting with HTML4, and develop HTML5. And that's really become the common standard, even though it's not officially completely supported, browsers are supporting it. It's in the process of becoming a standard and we're using it now. XHTML5 exists, but is not in common use and I do not recommend using it. So what happened? How did we get to XHTML? We combined 
HTML 4.1 and XML. And again, it's a much more restrictive set of writing standards. It allows for greater data exchange, but the fact that it wasn't backwards compatible is what brought together the WhatWig group, Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group. I'd like you to stop and look at that title for a moment. We aren't just making websites anymore. If we're doing it right, as we're moving into Web 3.0, we're making web applications. Well, what's an application? No, it's not that piece of paper that you fill out to go get a job. For the web, an application is the same as a program. We are actually writing programs where the interface with, between the human and the computer is designed using HTML. But there's a huge back end behind that where you have back end web servers that host databases that you access using a language like PHP and send information back and forth, typically using something like XML. So the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group, they didn't like the direction that XHTML 2.0 was heading. So they went back to the drawing board and we got HTML5, and it is a good standard. There was a while where I wasn't sure which one was going to win. Around 2005, I would have bet on XHTML 2.0 because it had more support at the time. XHTML5, in a nutshell, you'll see I took this from the WhatWig blog. <laughs> I love the please leave your sense of logic at the door. Well. What is the difference between HTML and XHTML really? Really, XHTML is HTML for programmers. It is very standardized and enforces good programming. So you can write HTML to strict standards and you're basically writing it in XHTML. So XHTML5 is a subset that includes the XH, the X HTML and HTML standards. And it's a polyglot. And I really included this side this slide because I liked to say polyglot markup. Because it combines a document to conform both standards together into a common subset. You don't really need it unless you're working with some specialized technology that's kind of beyond the scope of this class. So when we program, we're going to be using HTML5. Now it's mostly supported, but there are some things that are attributed to HTML5 that aren't HTML5 at all. Things like geolocation, knowing where your cell phone is at any given moment. That's related technology as in it is used alongside HTML5, but it's not part of the HTML5 code that you're going to learn in this class. We're going to use the basic core stuff. There's a lot of additional technologies so that the line sort of blurs where it starts and where it stops. They are worth studying, they are worthwhile, they help you make a really good web application, but they're beyond the scope of this class. We're really going to stick to making basic pretty traditional websites, though we are going to get into using some advanced technology. So I can introduce you to CMS content management systems, as well as making a site that will work on your phone, on your tablet, on your large screen computer. That's considered responsive design. And that's one of the things that we're really going to get into in the core functions of HTML5. Now what's really the difference between the current official standard, XHTML 1.0, and HTML5? Well, let's look at the doc type. And this is about as far as I want to go into it. The doc type when we're working with HTML or XHTML 1.0 is very long. It shows where the specification is at the W3C. It makes sense. But it's long and it's strict and it's kind of unforgiving. The lower doc type, doc type HTML, that's your standards for HTML5. 
The goal of HTML5 was to make it simple, elegant, and semantic. Now, I'm reasonably certain you know what the word simple and elegant mean. But what's semantic? According to the W3C, the semantic web provides a common framework that allows the data to be shared and reused across application, enterprise, and community boundaries. I'm sure that makes it completely clear to you. I think that an example really shows better the difference between our traditional HTML, which up to this point has been used to format our content, and semantic HTML. The semantic markup implies intention, not format. So if you're doing semantic markup, you'll use EM, which means emphasis, as opposed to I, which means italics. They actually appear the same way in most browsers unless you style them differently yourself. They're usually both going to appear in italics, but we're trying to separate the content from the presentation. So you put emphasis as part of the content that lets even readers, screen readers for the blind know this needs to be stronger. This is more important. You should read it with a different inflection in your voice because when you're reading the screen to somebody, you don't read verbally out loud in italics. And so you want to be semantic to describe the content instead of the formatting. And that's really what, where we're going with the semantic web. And that's one of the goals as we start to move towards web 3.0 is to have a semantic web. The other language that's critically important here is CSS, cascading style sheets. And because they exist, they allow us to separate the appearance of the web from the content of the web. So if we want to format how something looks, we do it in CSS, the contents in HTML. That's powerful. And the most important reason that it's powerful is with the help of a little bit of JavaScript, we can detect what sort of device is accessing our web page, and they'll get the exact same comment, but we can change the formatting so that it looks good on a phone or on its 27 inch monitor by changing the style sheet and leaving the content alone. That way we can make a beautiful, transparent, simple, elegant process of using the web for everybody who accesses our site. So we really have come a long way since we were designing web pages back in the late 1990s. I had a friend ask me the other day, has it gotten easier? What do you mean, has it gotten easier? Easier to make web pages? Yeah. Is it easier now with all the new technology out there? And my answer is no. I mean, you can go out there and there's all sorts of programs that are WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. So you can design something pretty quickly. But what, back when I started, you had to worry about a 15 inch, 17 inch or 19 inch monitor. It wasn't that hard to design one site to look good on those three sizes. Today, I have to design a site that looks good on my smartphone and on my 27 inch monitor. That's hard. That's really hard. That's responsive design. So we're really going to learn the fundamental basic tools that everything else starts building on. This is the foundation of your web design skills, but there's a lot more to learn after this class.